Welcome to the Wednesday, August 7th, 2019 edition of the Clemson Dubcast. Loaded down with content at TigerIllustrated.com. Never a better time than now to subscribe. Four to five content items a day from Paul Strilo. And yours truly, not going to find that kind of frequency of content combined with quality of content anywhere. For the first time ever, you can get 50% off of your subscription if you sign up now. TigerIllustrated.com. Title sponsor of the Clemson Dubcast, Harm Smith Arts and Hole Law Firm in downtown Greenville. They have been with us from the very beginning. Blake Smith has been a good friend of mine for years, dating back to the days when he taught a law class at Clemson with Terry Don Phillips, also Brooke Arch and Hold, major Clemson fans. The forte of their firm, which is at 15 Washington Park in Greenville, is medical negligence. They represent patients and their families in medical negligence actions, also handle all sorts of other personal injury litigation. Free consultations, Harm Smith and Arch and Hold. Give them a call, 864 990 45 or go to parhamlaw.com. Big supporter of the Clemson Dubcast is Harris Flooring America, based in Anderson, South Carolina. Harris Flooring has been instrumental in a lot of the facilities transformation you've seen on Clemson's campus lately, from the Allen Reeves Center to the McFadden Building to Memorial Stadium to the Neary Center, family-owned and operated since 1947. The owner, Scott Junkins, big Clemson guy. Harris Flooring is just as good inside the home and the residential realm as they are with the larger scale commercial stuff. Give them a call 864-642-6183 or online at flooringamerica-anderson.com. All right, the plan for the initial plan for today's dubcast was to talk with the FSU book guy, Bruce Thayer. Yeah, you know who I'm talking about. Uh, But then Chris Lowe's article talking to Dabo Sweeney about the supposed SEC fatigue by Alabama and all that came out and gave Chris a call. He's on the road and uh, decided to get his takeaway from uh, from Dabo's response to that oft-repeated theory this offseason, also sharing what he learned from his visit to Clemson yesterday and his visit with uh, the coaches and players. So we'll start with Chris Lowe and then the story of the FSU book guy after that. Enjoy. Okay, joined uh, by Chris Lowe, uh, my good friend from ESPN.com, spur of the moment. Um, you just sent me a text with your article about uh, Dabo Sweeney sort of responding to this uh, surprisingly persistent narrative that is honestly, I think, is the dumbest narrative of the entire offseason uh, as people try to sort of come to grips with what happened in San Jose. One of those narratives being... Uh, the primary part of that narrative, I guess, being that that uh, Alabama was just too worn down by the grind of the SEC and they weren't the same team that they were in October. Um, first of all, what uh, was your, I guess, the synopsis of, of what Dabo said to you uh, and then your take on that? Well, I think the biggest thing in, in spending some time with Dabo yesterday, Larry, is he's just – he doesn't want his team – or anything they accomplished last year to be diminished by any narrative. You know, he's not really shooting a Nick Saban or Alabama. He just, I think he's getting tired of hearing that, that somehow there was a reason why Clemson won and Alabama didn't, other, other than the fact that Clemson was a better football team and was dominant in that game. You know, and they were dominant in the first playoff game against Notre Dame, you know, a team that, you know, had, 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 had swept through the season. So I think that's the big thing is he doesn't want, anybody or earning air to about there to take away from what Clemson accomplished last year. And he told me, so that was a dominant football team. We had a dominant team um, that played that way all year long. Now they had some, you know, had a close call obviously against Syracuse and the Texas a game was, was a close one, but uh, on the big stage, they were, uh, I don't think anybody, anybody could debate that they were clearly the better football team. Chris, the morning of, of January 7th, if you told me Clemson wins this game, this game by four touchdowns, I would have said there's no way in heck that any part of the offseason 
is marked by sort of skepticism of, of, of Clemson and their accomplishment and, and, and sort of, you know, like I said, trying to come to grips with, with what happened. Are you surprised that this is – and this has not been from everybody. It hasn't been from all SEC media and all that. It's been pockets of of media folks who, who, have, who have been trying to advance this. But are you surprised that – uh, that, that that this has been kind of a, a theme? Not really, because <laughs> Alabama's won so much since Nick's been there, and when they do lose, and, and the fact that they got beaten up, that's the thing. That's that's the worst they've been beaten. We talked about this last night, Larry. No one's beaten them that badly since your buddy, the head ball coach in South Carolina back in 2010. And I just think that people were so un- unaccustomed to Alabama getting exposed like that. And, you know, Nick told me that himself when I was with Alabama last weekend. I don't know if you saw the interview I did with him. He said it. He said, we were exposed. Yeah. Uh, those, that was his word. Um, but people just aren't accustomed to that. And I think they're looking around, well, well, Alabama played this schedule, Clemson played that schedule. Listen, you know, I've covered the SEC for a long time, and, and I don't think the ACC uh, is as tough as the SEC. I think there is probably a little bit – uh, more of a grind of the SEC. But I agree, also agree with Dabo that the SEC probably hasn't been as deep the last few years as it was, you know, several years ago. And the big difference to me last year, when you look at sort of what each team faced going into the playoff, is Alabama played a Georgia team that was, I think most people agree, Georgia was one of the top three to five, three to five teams in college football last year. And Clemson plays, played Pittsburgh. In their, in their respective conference championship games. Now, is that Clemson's fault? Is it, you know, no, that's just the way it works out. And the big, the other big difference with Clemson right now, when you look at not even Clemson, but the ACC, is Florida State's not Florida State. And, and we talked about that last night. So they're going to get back to being Florida State at some point when they get the right guy in there. But they certainly aren't now. And that waters down the ACC significantly because there's no reason that Florida State shouldn't be on an annual basis, a top 10 team when you look at their tradition and their recruiting base. And they'll get back to that point at some point. But no, I I told uh, somebody this just a minute ago. Actually, somebody I was talking to in Alabama. I was at Alabama last week. I was at Clemson the last day and a half. And here's the point I would make over and above everything else. That those two teams, Larry, look unlike any other two teams I've seen in college football. Yeah. From a size, length, athleticism, depth, explosiveness. Uh, they just got a bunch of cats walking around campus that aren't supposed to be that big and that athletic and that explosive. And I've, ha- I've seen both of them up close the last two weekends, and I don't think that's going to change this year. I'd be very, very surprised. You never know in college football, injuries, and off-the-field stuff, you know, but I'd be very surprised if those two teams are on the playoff again and probably end up playing again. Here's the the off season storyline that really hasn't I haven't heard much of that really it should be a primary storyline and and I'm you know I'm not I don't think I'm a homer really I mean I had full disclosure I picked Alabama to win that game so you know um, but I and and I think we've discussed this before uh, and I know that Clemson's staff went into that game their offensive staff thinking that this is not the typical. Alabama defense. They were really confident that, that they were going to put up some points. Um, Savion Smith was a, a, a big weakness. I think that's probably what Saban was talking about in part uh, when he said they got exposed. They're, they're missing Trayvon Diggs, uh, who got hurt earlier in the year. I'm wondering, and again, what I should be the one of the main storylines is how is Alabama – uh, going to be equipped, better equipped, I guess, in the secondary uh, to cover in this. Yeah, and, I, and I think, yeah, I think you're onto something there. I think to me, a bigger factor, a bigger storyline than they were worn out by the SEC grind is, is they weren't very healthy on defense. They were missing some key components. Remember, Christian Miller, who at that point was their best edge rusher, didn't play in the game. You know, they missed him. Terrell Lewis, who was their best rusher, missed the whole season. And then you, you mentioned Diggs was hurt. I mean. Uh, they had some key guys that didn't play and it didn't show up in a lot of games they played, but against a team like Clemson and their receiving core and Trevor Lawrence, it, it, it showed up, 
And I think they'll be better. You know, the, the, there's a Joe kid there, a, a young corner that they really like. They feel like he's going to be a, you know, a, a fantastic player. Uh, they feel like they're a little deeper. I feel like they'll get better rush off the edge. You know, Terrell Lewis has got to stay healthy. He hasn't been healthy for the last two years. Uh, Raquan Davis is probably Larry more focused and in better shape that he's ever been in up front defensively, you know, so you keep those guys on track and healthy, then it, it'll, it's a different looking Alabama defense. But no, I agree. I think going into that game, it was not a, it was not close to being on the same level as some of the great Alabama defenses I've seen over the last few years for, for a number of different reasons. And when you couple that with the fact that they were going against an Clemson offense, it was so explosive. You know, Lawrence was just, you know, humming along. They had great receivers. They protected him. And, and you got a running game to go with it. I, you know, I, I thought Clemson had, I, I thought Alabama would win, but I certainly wasn't going to be shocked if Clemson won. Now, the, the shocking part to me was, again, that they just, they didn't beat him. They thrashed him. They beat him badly. I mean, they scored the last 30 points of that game. And um, held the ball and, for the last 10 plus minutes. Yeah, you never, and after they took that lead, Clemson, I don't know about you, but I never really had a feeling that Alabama was going to come back and beat them. It's amazing we're still talking about that game here. Uh, but don't don't you think that though there's a bigger picture here, and that is that those two teams have sort of become the face of college football, much like the Lakers and the Celtics. I know I'm dating myself here, but the Lakers and the Celtics were the face of the NBA for so long in the '80s. It, it, it just you know some people got tired of seeing those two teams. Some people did, and I loved it. You know, and Dabo talked about that, too, that, hey, people say this is bad for the sport, that it's Alabama and Clemson. I mean, I don't agree with that. I love seeing the two best teams go at it. I, these two teams recruit against each other a lot. And contrary to popular belief, and you know this, Larry, Dabo and Nick have big-time respect for each other. They get along. They have, In fact, I saw Dabo's new letter from Nick congratulating him and, and paying up the bet. They had the standing bet at their favorite restaurant there in Boca Grande, uh, but they respect the heck out of each other, the way they do it, you know, the, the success that they've had. Um, and again, they recruit a lot of the same players and the programs mirror each other, the way they built from the inside out. Um, but I, I've got no problems whatsoever seeing them go at it again with the, with the title on the line this January. How did, how would you describe Dabo's, uh, I guess, emotions when that topic came up? Um, was he agitated? Was it more just matter of fact? Uh, he wasn't really agitated. He was just Dabo. I mean, you know him as well or better than I know him. He just, you know, where, where's this stuff come from? You know what I mean? <laughs> you know how he is. I, you, listen, you, know, I, you know, I have enormous respect for Nick and what they've done there. But you know, we beat him by X amount of points, and they won by 33 points a game. You know, that's sort of just typical Dabo. You know, I think the thing that probably agitates him the most is he doesn't want the kids on that team because he's got a lot of respect. For all the kids that came back to school, like the Christian Wilkins and the Cleve Farrell, you know, those guys came back. And he doesn't want what they accomplished and, and what they meant to that program diminished by any kind of narrative or theory that somehow, you know, under, not underscores, but sort of counsels out that they went and beat a really, really good Alabama football team badly on a big stage. I think that's, that's probably what agitates him more than anything. I don't think it's really anything against Nick Saban or Alabama. Cause a lot of this, and he's, he made a point to say a lot of this has been in media circles. Not yeah. some of the Alabama players made some comments, you know, about who was the best team that they played. And, and Saban has said that they had some distractions, which I know he's still upset about some of the, the guys in the staff that were looking to leave. You know, and, and, and going and better themselves. But you know what? You know, Nick's going to have to get used to that because when you go work for him, guys are going to come to Alabama and work there because they're going to want to work for him because they think it's going to lead to something bigger and better on down the road. And we've seen that happen time and time again, whether it's Mike Loxley, whether it's Josh Gaddis, Lane Kiffin. You know, you can go on and on and on. And that's just part of it. He's, he's so old school that he hates that. You know, he he he's not old school in that he's unwilling to to adapt and evolve, as you know. He's done that as well as anybody. But he hates the fact that 
when you get later in the season like that, you got guys thinking about the NFL, you got coaches, maybe with on aisle, what's the next job? That's the part that, that he just has a hard time wrapping his hands around. And, and really, you know, one of the main stories from SEC Media Days a few weeks ago was Saban revealing that, 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 that he has struggled to, to keep the focus of his coaches um, late in the year. And, and that provoked a lot of emotional responses and back and forth. But I think the, the most important takeaway from that is that Dabo did not have that problem, does not have that problem, no. and, and, and has really, not only has Dabo and Clemson, have they pulled even, you know, uh, in, in, in terms of talent, I believe, but Dabo is, I mean, this is, a, this is not unreasonable to say, he has smoked him, uh, Nick Saban, in the area of coaching acquisitions and development and retention, right? Yeah, well, he, I mean, he's been able to keep Brett Venables, right. Tony Elliott. And those guys, and even even guys that have moved on to retirement. I mean, Dan Brooks, his defensive line coach, was on that staff for a long time. Those guys were, you know, you're right. The cohesion and the continuity, I mean, has made a big difference. Every every coach is different, and you know, a lot of Knicks guys have come through there have gone on to be head coaches. You know, Loxley goes. I mean, to be a head coach in Maryland. You know, McElwain goes on to be a head coach. I mean, Lane Kiffin gets a head job. Uh, a lot of those guys have come through there. Josh Gaddis goes to Michigan to be the, the, the top offensive play caller. So it's not like, you know, you're bringing in guys and then saying, I don't like this guy. And they're going on to bigger and better things. Sark goes when he, you know, he comes in briefly, calls plays against Clemson a couple of years ago, and then he gets the OC job with the Atlanta Falcons. And now Sark is back. The one thing I, I will say about Nick Staff now is you see – Several guys who've worked for him before, like a Sarkees and like a South Sun Series. You see some veteran guys, Charles Kelly, who's been around and been a good coach for a long time. And I think he feels like a better mix, Larry, of guys who can coach and recruit. You know, he made the conscientious decision to get younger a few years ago. Maybe that cost him a little bit off the field. I don't know. Um, but he's not, you know, Saban's not hesitant or afraid to try things, to tweak things. I mean, we, you know, and the best. The best coaches are like that. But, no, I, I, I got a ton of admiration for what Dabo has been able to do and keep his staff together. Uh, and I think you see the results they've had on the field because of it. Yeah, I guess the point is is that, is that you know, this past season and previous seasons, Dabo didn't just luck up and have his coaches and players, you know, remained, remain 100% focused and galvanized on that their goal that that's something that's part of what they do that's part of their culture and so um that that's a that's a check mark in their favor or should be viewed as such uh, because it's hard it's so hard to do it's so hard to keep the focus of of players and coaches uh, through through a long a long season and you, you know you spend much time around clemson and you live there you're there all the time but I always remind myself when i'm there just what a, you know i know this is a cliche but what a special place it is and it is a great culture. The people there, people like Woody McCorvey, you know, Woody, Woody and Dabo go back to when Dabo was playing for him in Alabama, you know, and I, I was kidding Woody yesterday about his old buddy, Ellis Johnson has built him a place down in Pauley's Island. I said, you're going to join him. He said, heck no, man, I ain't leaving Clemson, but people get there and they don't want to leave. I mean, and, and Dabo is a huge part of that. I mean, Dabo fits perfectly. Fit is everything in college football, getting the right guy, a guy that fits his head coach. And I can't think of anybody in college football at the head coach position who fits their university and that community better than Dabo. Maybe the only one that would rival him would be David Cutcliffe at Duke because of who David is, the kind of person he is, and the kind of kids he likes to recruit. I mean, he's a perfect fit at Duke as well. But Dabo at Clemson, and, and just a, it's a gorgeous place. It's a great place to live, to raise a family. You know, and how else do you explain? I know that everybody's always going to, there's always going to be conspiracy theorists out there, but keeping guys like Christian Wilkins and Cleve Farrell and those guys who came back, who could have gone in, 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 you know, high in the NFL draft to come back to their senior seasons and sort of finish what they started and, and, and win another national championship. That doesn't just happen anywhere. 
Yeah, a few nights ago, Dabo's coming off the practice fields, coming over to talk to, to the media, and he says, Wow, what a night. What a beautiful <laughs> night. Can y'all believe we get to live in this place? Just, I can't think of any other coach who would make such an, an expression, you know, such a spontaneous expression of just savoring where they are, what they're doing. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just, uh, it's pretty cool. He finds the joy in every day. He really does. And it's probably, you know, hey, none of us are perfect. We're all flawed, but that's probably a, a pretty good model for all of us to try to find the joy in every day. And yeah, I'll tell you a story. I was there with him yesterday. Maria Taylor and Holly Rowe from ESPN were there doing sort of a tour with him on TV. And they're in the, the open part of the, the Reeves complex lobby and doing some stuff. Well, there are a few that that place is open, as you know. A few fans will walk in there and look at the national championship trophies. And Dabo was in there, and there were a couple families, and they were just awestruck at the see, you know, here's Dabo, here's the coach. And so he finishes, Dabo finishes his stuff with Holly and Maria, and he looks over and sees them. He says, you guys want a picture? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, sure. So they all come over there and get pictures. And about that time, David Seville, who – you know, the, the, the beloved equipment managers there comes running in and one, r- runs over and hugs Dabo. That's why, you know, you never say never. And who knows how things are going to change, and what it's going to be like three years from now. Because I don't know if you saw the other piece I did on Twitter, Dabo talking about Nick saying he ain't ever going to retire, which he's probably right. Yeah. Dabo may retire before Saban does, you know. But um, that's the other reason I don't think Dabo's ever – and leave Clemson, but you never say never. You never know what's going to change in people's lives and what's going to change the university. But he just he loves it there. He fits there. Um, you know, his family, his boys have all grown up there. I just uh, I think that Clemson's such a big part of who he is, and he's such a big part of Clemson. And, and then if you look at it from the football perspective, Larry, why would he leave? Who who in their right mind would want to go in behind Nick Saban in Alabama? You know, and especially when you got it going as well as Dabo does at Clemson. Yes. Uh, Chris, can you tell us what the note from Nick Saban said, or was that confidential? You know, I don't, I can't tell you verbatim. It just very, very um, similar to what it was the last time that, that, you know, he really enjoys competing against him. He does it the right way. Um, enjoy your dinner or something like that on us. And, We'll, we'll catch up, something like that, you know. But those guys get along very well. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a very healthy mutual respect between the two of them. Um, they're both fierce competitors. And uh, I, I could tell you this, honestly, and all the time I've spent with Dabo and Nick, and I spent a bunch of time with both of them, I don't ever remember either one of them off the record, just in passing, saying anything about the other one that was not, you know, complimentary. You know, they <laughs> they may gripe about getting beat on the recruiting trail by the other one for a player because they re- recruited each other a lot. But uh, no, I think there's a very, there's a very healthy respect between the two. And I asked Davo, I said, "So you gonna you gonna have that meal?" He said, "Oh yeah, oh yeah, gonna have, gonna have it. It'll taste good." I, I think the name of the place is the restaurant's like the is it the Temptation or yes, something like that? Yes, that's that's it. There's a whole letter and it's framed and Davo actually pointed out to me last year, the one from the last time. And there's a check from the from the Saban family <laughs> to the Sweeney family. It's amazing. You talk about the importance of recruiting and some of the head to head battles they've had. Justin Ross, I mean, like one player going oh. to one school over the other. Just how freaking monumental was that? I mean I uh, who knows? I don't, you don't want to play the what well, if game. Well, that's the thing Dabo has been able to do. And you know it. You follow it closer than anybody. Just look at all the states he's able to go into and get great players. You know, Alabama, Tennessee. Gosh, he goes up to Connecticut, gets Christian Wilkins, Florida. I mean, he's all over the place. Texas. I mean, where does he not, if they really want a player, is he not able to go in and get players? And that's what, to me, is, is what sort of separated them. And help them, you know, catch Alabama. Whatever you want to say, catch them, pass them, be right there in the same waters with them. Is much like Alabama's been able to do that, go into all these different states and get great players. Uh, so has Clemson. 
Chris Lowe, I know you got to go on Fine Bomb here in a little while. That should be uh, interesting. So I uh, really appreciate you jumping on the podcast on short notice and uh, great work as always. I know the Clemson coaches appreciate you and uh, look forward to seeing you this coming season. Same to you, Larry. Look, always look forward to reading your stuff, and we'll talk soon, man. Thank you, buddy. Over the 10 or so months we've been doing the dubcast, we've developed a great relationship with the folks over at the Abernathy Boutique Hotel. In addition to being a great meeting spot for our interviews we conduct with uh, local personalities, it's also a fantastic place to stay. The Abernathy is rolling out a loyalty savings program for 2019. After your third stay, you'll automatically be rewarded with an exclusive offer. It can be applied to future reservations for the remainder of the year. 15% off rooms, 15% off food and beverage at Taps Bar and Cafe. Learn more at theabernathy.com. Quick word about Uptown Realty LLC, headed up by Patrick Enzer, former sports writer who decided to get into the real estate game. Uptown Realty locally owned and operated out of Sumter, but they serve the Eastern Midlands and PD area with the buying and selling of homes, commercial properties, and land. They also offer affordable new housing in the mid 130000 from a local custom builder. Patrick is the sole owner and broker in charge. Grew up in Anderson, going to Clemson games, been in Sumter for 15 years. Loyal Tiger Illustrated subscriber, loyal Dubcast listener. Website is UptownRealtySC.com. Okay, now we transition to Professor Bruce Thayer, who one day last fall decided that the annihilation on the field in front of him at the hands of Clemson to Florida State was just uh, not as entertaining as uh, reading a book. And you know what happened after that. All right, so here we go. Enjoy. Okay, joined by... Do you go by FSU book guy or Bruce Thayer? I go by Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny. We were just talking off the air. I, I informed you yesterday when we chatted that I dressed up as you for Halloween. And uh, you I sent you the picture yesterday and you just posted it to your Facebook page, you said? I did. Got lots of commentary from friends and family. They thought it was great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to toot my own horn here but uh Dabo Sweeney saw it last fall and he reminded he reminded a group of us about a few weeks ago it was the best Halloween costume he's ever seen so <laughs> I, have to, I have to thank you for that sure all right let's get started I, I guess it'd be good to to let people know um a little bit about who you are uh I guess outside of your in stadium reading ventures during uh blowouts so you're a you're about i guess 65 still bruce i turned 66 last week and i'm a professor of social work at florida state university i've been here since 2002 and prior to that i was at 15 years just down the road from you at the university of georgia in athens okay so lots of clemson experience yeah phd in social work and psychology from michigan that's right yeah and got my master's in social work from the university of georgia Okay, founding and current editor of the journal Research on Social Work Practice, now in its yep. 26th year of publication. Uh, 30th now, and a couple more journals at that, but we don't need to get into that. Your, your, your listeners won't be interested in that stuff. Uh, it's pretty interesting. You've produced over 275 journal articles, over 100 book chapters, and over 35 books in the areas of social work, psychology. Usually while writing, yeah, usually while writing on my laptop during football games. <laughs> So, okay, you've been, you were uh, the dean of, of uh, uh, with the College of Social Work starting in 2002, and then you decided that you just wanted to be a professor. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. I stepped down as dean, and I'm now very happy as a professor. Okay, excellent. It, it's interesting. Just a few weeks ago, a good friend of mine called me up and said, you know who you need to interview is the FSU book guy. And then... Uh, David Hale of ESPN.com about a week later, probably less than a week, uh, shared with me that he was doing a, a an article, uh, reporting an article on all the different fan uh, memes and, and fans who have become famous just by their general reactions to stuff at, at football games. And so uh, after I read his article, which was a great article, I was like determined to get you, uh, get you on the phone. So, uh, uh, credit to David for for giving uh, for sort of continuing to inspire the idea and, and giving me your number. Uh, what is your life, or I guess what was your life like immediately after that happened? 
Oh, gosh. Um, podcast at a local restaurant, uh, television interview with a local TV station. Um, went to Thanksgiving a month or two later, and one of my cousins has made up a dozen uh, FSU Bookman T-shirts, and um, they were all wearing them at the family reunion for Thanksgiving, which was a lot of fun. So we went outside and posed with my shirt off reading the book, and everybody standing around me wearing the T-shirts. That was sort of cute. <laughs> and then periodically um, calls from guys like you. And, and just last week, I got an email from a Clemson fan who wanted me to come to a game and sit with their tailgate. <laughs> so um, I, I told him, sure, just want to hear what, <clears throat> what the game is. Well, maybe and the then, Florida State game. No, oh, that would be fabulous, wouldn't it? Sitting there in Death Valley watching Florida State beat up on Clemson. <laughs> so, so you... So she did not specify the game. No, it was it was left open ended. I don't know if it was serious or not. And I got another email. Somebody wants to send me two copies of uh, Dark Places, Dark Passages, the book I was reading, and ins- inscribe them so I can send them to uh, her friends. So it's it's been good fun. I guess the the operative part of of me mentioning your your distinguished uh, career is, is, is it sounds like you've gotten more recognition off of that FaceTime at the game uh, than maybe you have for, from being a distinguished uh, person in your field. Yeah. It's sort of sad, isn't it? You know, working for 40 years, writing and teaching and graduating PhDs. And the thing I'm known for is this uh, clip on ESPN. So anyway, uh, a little bit of that's better than nothing. So as as David Hale chronicled in his article, you had a you took a trip to the Virgin Islands to go scuba diving this this summer? Yeah, I, I stayed at a resort down there and they have a place where you can uh book sailing trips and charters and things like that. And um during the course of the conversation with the young woman who was the clerk at the desk, she mentioned she was a big Clemson fan. And I asked her if she'd seen the Clemson, Florida State game. And she said, yeah. And I said, well, did you see the clip on ESPN about the guy reading the book in the stadium? She said, yeah. And I know that was me. And she looked at me and said, really? You're the FSU book man? And then from the next room, um, I heard the screech of another woman. The FSU book man is here. She came around out. She was a man. <laughs> and so she was all happy about that. And they ended up giving me a discount on my booking, which was a nice benefit. <laughs> so... So that was fun. Not quite international fame, but there. I don't know. Maybe international. So yeah. l- let's let's um, let's just go back back to that day. You go to the game with your uh, your daughter, who was a is was a freshman at, at Florida State this past season. Um, she's something? actually a, a rising junior, I think, and um, she lives here in town and uh, has an apartment with her brother, my other my son. And uh, she asked me to take her to the game and get tickets for her and several of her girlfriends, which I did. And um, uh, got us good seats, 50-yard line or so. And as you know, FSU was way behind at halftime. And my daughter said that she and her girlfriends were bored and they were going to go. I said, all right. So I stayed. And I was in the shady part of the stadium, got to feel a little chilly. I looked across the stadium way on the other side, big empty spaces in the sunshine with nobody around. And I said, I'm going to go sit up there, (laughs) get warm. So I wandered around at the beginning of the third quarter and plopped myself down. And after a few minutes, I I may as well get some sun. Nobody around me. So I took off my shirt and um, I had a paperback book with me. And uh, so I began to read. And um, after a little while, my phone rang. It was a friend of mine in Cleveland, Ohio. He said, are you at the FSU game reading a book? I said, yeah, why? He said, well, you just made ESPN, man. (laughs) So I said, oh, that's that's interesting. And after a while, people began walking up to me. He said, hey, do you know you're on ESPN? And people were sharing the image all around the stadium. One girl said, well, can I sit next to you? Maybe I can get on ESPN, too. I said, sure. So she sat next to me, and after a few minutes, one of her girlfriends phoned her and said, oh, you just on ESPN, too. So, um, you know, after a while, people drifted away, I say, to the end of the game. And uh, the only thing I regret is that uh, I was reading Jillian Flynn's book, and if I'd known what was going to happen, I would have brought one of my own books for some free publicity. 
So at what point, I mean, I'm, I don't know if you're on social media or whatever, but I'm, I'm wondering at what point you realized just how, I guess, viral that had become. Just heard about it from my, my, my friends and my kids. My kids are on Twitter. I'm not, um, I'm on Facebook and I got a lot of, uh, of uh, messages about that through them and also people emailing me. But um, apparently it went around a lot on Twitter and uh, just sort of spun around for a while and gradually died off. And every once in a while, things like David Hale's article comes back up and then there's a renewed burst of activity. People send me the link, stuff like that. And then for the rest of the fall after that game, sometimes on the uh, football recap programs on the weekends, they would talk about, you know, interesting things of the season or highlights or something like that. And sometimes uh, ESPN or other or other networks would, would throw me up there. Completely uh, spontaneous, uncontrived, uh, just minding my own business, sitting in the sun, reading the book, watching a game. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that, except we were losing badly. So I um, thought about doing it again for a future game, but it would lose some of its charm, <laughs> I think, because it would be contrived and everybody would know that. Oh, like a sequel. Yeah. So some people now, might... Now, go if, ahead. Nick, if Nick Saban, he's your coach, right? No, that's Davo Sweeney. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. So if, you're, if your coach came along and said, Bruce, would you like to be our guest? <laughs> in the sidelines with your shirt off during the next FSU game <laughs> on the Clemson side. I'd be glad to do that. So some people are, are private and, and would not be, I guess, comfortable with the fact that, that they had become such a such an instant celebrity. How did you, what was your sort of, uh, how did you receive it? Oh, I don't, I don't consider it really celebrity at all. It's very minor, just an accident. Um, sort of like these uh, videos you see of people dressed weirdly at Walmart. You know, I don't call that fame. It's not being famous or anything like that. It was just fun. And ESPN picked it up and it was an accident. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. It really hasn't changed anything. How much did you pay for the tickets? You said they were 50-yard line, like really good seats on the, yeah, on the good yeah. side. Um, I don't know. They weren't real expensive because it was expected to be a poor game from the point of view of FSU. And, then, and I just picked them up from scalpers outside the stadium, you know, 20 minutes before kickoff. So maybe like 20 bucks a pop? I can't remember, honestly. And how did you get such a tan? Sitting in the sun? <laughs> we live in Florida here. It's part of the... <laughs> The natural uh, course of events. You take a book everywhere you go with you? Almost always. Almost always. Years and years ago, this is going to sound weird, I read a, a self-help book by a feminist writer named Gloria Steinem. No, that wasn't wasn't Gloria Steinem. Who was it? Helen Gurley Brown, that's who it was. She was the editor of Cosmopolitan Magazine, that woman's magazine. And she wrote a self-help book called Having It All. And um, among the many things she recommended is that always go with something to do. That way, when you've got downtime, you've got to wait, or sitting, waiting for a plane or something like that. You've got something to engage you. So I almost always have a book with me or some work to do or something like that. It's just second nature. So you, you were at Florida State in the mid-'80s for a couple of years? Yeah, my first academic job, I was here from 84 to 87. Then the University of Georgia offered me a job with a nice raise. So I went back to there where I got my master's degree some years earlier. How involved or, I guess, interested were you in football uh, back then, I guess, at, at Florida State and at Georgia? Oh, even 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 more so. Um, I'll, I'll tell this to you. Well, no, I won't. Never mind. Um, I, I religiously went to FSU football games, uh, with my then wife, usually with her girlfriend, sometimes with her kid, with one of our kids or more, I have four. And I do remember that about two weeks after my first son was born, my wife and I went to the game with our son, John, in a, in a papoose sling in front of my wife's chest and we're walking into the game and it's crowded with people it's very exciting and walking towards us is my wife's obstetrician who delivered my son two weeks earlier and he looked at us and he, i could tell he didn't approve of taking his two-week-old baby to a football game wow but we did and we had a nice time and uh brought the kids periodically as the years went by um but yeah i i 
went a lot. In fact, just the other day, I bought a bronze little statue of a bulldog uh, for my uh, apartment. Oh, so you're still a big Georgia fan. I'm a big Georgia fan. I also love the University of Michigan, where I went to get my Ph.D., and I'm at Florida State. Those are the three teams I follow. What do you remember from those couple of years? I mean, that was in the 80s. That was when Florida State was really ascending under Bobby Bowden. Yeah, we had a great history under Bobby Bowden, and um, it was it was sort of sad when he retired. But um, you know, everybody has to peak and and step down. And we had some good runs under Jimbo Fisher, and um, not such a good year last year under Coach Taggart. Means to be seen how we'll do this year. But we got a you know we got a the makings of a really good team. We got a fabulous football facility. In fact, my office is in the football stadium. Some years ago, they uh, added a bunch of classrooms and office buildings to the football stadium. And that's actually where I'm talking from right now. And you sent your, your other three children, I guess all boys. That's correct. I have three boys and a daughter. And they've, you you sent the, the three boys you sent to Flo- to Florida state as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, two boys have graduated and, um, One's here, uh, senior in engineering, and my daughter's a junior in uh, studying English, wants to be a teacher. Okay. So are you school? Yeah. So are you like a college football nut or just have an affinity for the. No, 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 not at all. I, I love to go, it's sort of fun. But I just don't follow the football teams for the football. Like, I won't watch, let's say, Tennessee versus Vanderbilt or something like that. That that has no interest to me. But if it's one of the teams that I'm playing, I got them laid out in my calendar already. I know where they're going to be. And if I can't see them in person, I might go to a sports bar. There's a Michigan alumni group here, and, and we get together to watch the, home, the, uh, the televised games at a local bar. And that's fun. I guess if you thought that Clemson's coach is Nick Saban, you don't watch too much Clemson or, or Alabama. Yeah, I, I, I caught myself. I think he's the coach <laughs> of Alabama, another another nemesis of Georgia. <laughs> the, uh, Sorry about that, coach no, no. Clemson. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure he's. Uh, I'm sure he's okay with it. So, do you tr- do you travel to any of the games at all? Just home games. Not too often. I have been to a home game when FSU played Clemson around uh, 2003, 2004. I think you call your place Death Valley. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, like George's Between the Hedges. And yeah, it was a, it was a nice, modest size uh, football stadium for a medium size uh, college. I, I enjoyed it. Oh, that must have been the 03 game when Georgia won uh, 30 to nothing. In that. No, that was it was FSU, not oh, okay. Georgia. Okay, oh, so that's right. You I, was the, I was the dean, and um, one of the uh, broadcasters asked me to come to the uh, Clemson game at Clemson and be interviewed during the halftime and talk about my program, which I did. At Clemson? Yeah, at Clemson. Okay, so uh, was that the night game? Yeah, it was. That was in 03 when uh, Florida State was number three. Tommy Bowden was about to get fired. Uh, er, nobody thought Clemson had a chance in that game, and Clemson wins twenty six to ten, I believe. And Bowden stayed on for a few more years. Do you remember any of the details yeah, from that you night? Have a better, you have a better memory than I do. Yeah. And so that's where you sort of cemented your move to back to Tallahassee was at Death Valley when you. Well, it was awfully fun to be asked to go to the football game and be interviewed, talk about my program at Clemson, try and get some of those good South Carolina people to come to uh, Florida to get their master's in social work. What uh, do you ever ever uh, have any athletes, football players in your classes? Not too often because our, our degree requires a lengthy internship. And it doesn't have the flexibility they need for all their practices and away games. What was the reception from your students the next week after that after that game uh, last oh, fall? Oh, they loved it. They they loved it. They really loved it. Yeah. 
the newest supporter of the Clemson Dubcast and winner of the Clemson Area Chamber of Commerce Business of the Year Award, Founders Federal Credit Union. If you've been to a sporting event in Clemson, you've probably heard about Founders already. They are the official credit union partner of the Clemson Tigers, and all Clemson faculty, staff, and students are eligible for membership as well as IPTE members. Matt Gross is a proud Clemson alum and the vice president for the Clemson market for Founders Federal Credit Union. Membership at Founders has many benefits, great rates on loans and savings products, advice on investments and insurance products, and even a Clemson debit card available for any Founders member with a checking account. Founders Federal Credit Union is federally insured by the NCUA. If you're in Clemson, stop by and see Matt and his staff at 680 Old Greenville Highway, Suite 300, right next to the Walmart Neighborhood Market. If you run a business that conducts credit card transactions with customers, you got to learn about Tandem Payment. Credit card processing company has offices throughout the Southeast, but the one in Greenville and the upstate, headed up by a 2005 Clemson grad, Tandem's technology allows business owners to offset their credit card processing costs by applying a small customer service charge to each sale they make. Tandem has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and was awarded the Better Business Integrity Award in 2013. Check them out at tandempayment.com. What do you, I mean, if if you're big into Florida State football, you have to have some sort of an opinion on the decline of Florida State football. Uh, it's been so rapid and and shocking, really, just given that they won. Uh, you know, five years ago, they're coming off a off a national championship. Um, what is it like down there? How are people receiving this? Uh, just this sort of state of, I guess, not even mediocrity, but less than that. Ooh, ouch. Well, um, I'm enough of a statistician to know that everything ebbs and flows. And, um, you know, I was a big, I am a big Michigan fan. They had a low point for a while lately. They've come back done pretty well. Georgia had some low points. They're doing pretty well now. I think they're ranked number three, in the coaches poll, uh, and Florida state's having its ebb and its flow and it's going to come back. It'll be, it'll be just fine. Um, we, we are real, uh, attractive program for people to come to it's a great university and the uh, the athletic training facilities are outstanding and so we don't have too much trouble uh recruiting and you get some good recruits in here uh we'll be back what do you think of willie taggart never met him uh looking forward to having a lunch invitation from him but uh haven't met him yet uh the first year is disappointing, but he came on board under sort of abrupt circumstances. You know, Jimbo Fisher quit abruptly, and uh, I believe he went off to Texas, one of the Texas schools. And um, so they sort of had to scramble in a hurry to find a coach, and he stepped up, and I think he came here from Oregon. And um, I, I, I wish him well. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm not a coach. I can't offer him any advice about what to do. I'm confident that he and all his other coaches will uh, do the best they can to have a good season this year. You said you have a lunch appointment with him coming up? No, no, I'm looking forward to it. I, I wish you'd invite me to lunch. Oh. <laughs> what did you same think? Thing with your, yeah. Same thing with your coach. What did you think of Jimbo leaving? It was disappointing. Um, but, you know, you got to do things for your career. And I guess he had some um, other personal issues that made a uh, move advisable. And uh, it sort of left a bad taste in the, in, the, in the mouths of people in Tallahassee. It was abrupt and no time for saying farewells and uh, wishing him well or something. They just sort of like drifted off into the night. And um, a lot of people didn't think that was uh, very well handled. As a professor, you know, a member of the university community, what is your, I guess, view on how big college athletics in general and college football in particular uh, have become, you know, with coaches making nine, ten million dollars a year? And uh, just curious to hear your perspective on that as a as a member of the of the faculty. Well, I'm sure the bean counters have it all figured out, and the coaches must be worth what they're being paid. On the other hand, I think that the college athletics is um, uh, pretty exploitative of of the uh, student athletes, particularly like with football, where there's the prospect of uh, serious lifetime physical injury. Um, you know, we treat the athletes really well, you know, special dorms and scholarships and other perks and privileges that the usual student doesn't have access to. But boy, for entertainment, I, I certainly enjoy it. 
um, and not just football, but uh, basketball and baseball. We're doing pretty well in that. Um, so it's not my call. I'm not the guy running the engine. Um, I'm one of the passengers on university train, and, and I enjoy it all. Um, but I'm also aware that the, the kids are um, sometimes exploited. I mean, they don't see all the vast revenue that comes into the university because their efforts out there on the football field. And I know that with the NCAA, they can't. Um, and, and some of them, very few, get to go and have uh, lucrative careers in the NFL. Um, but, you know, I know that uh, places like University of Chicago don't have football at all. And they do just fine as a university. So if, if suddenly it was to disappear, I wouldn't be crushed. The university would move on. But I don't think that's going to happen, and I certainly will continue to enjoy it. What, uh, back in, in the fall of, of 2014, uh, Jameis Winston drew a lot of criticism for his, I guess putting it kindly, questionable behavior. Uh, uh, there was the crab legs uh, incident. There was the outburst, I guess, on campus uh, the week of the Clemson game, I think it was, uh, that he got suspended for. What was... Uh, what was that like for the community having, I guess, a, a such a high profile player doing high profile sort of things that might have embarrassed people? And, and what was your view of it at the time? Yeah, well, charitably, we could call these things shenanigans. Less charitably, we could call some of these things crimes. And as far as I'm concerned, um, there should be a one strike you're out rule that if an athlete who's been given the privilege to come to a great university like Florida State or like Clemson, they do something that's a crime. Um, and it causes uh, injury to the reputation of the university as well as themselves. I think the next day, goodbye, you are gone. You've lost your scholarship. You've lost your dorm. You're disenrolled from the university. Um, and, and that's over with. But sometimes we see uh, these, these students, and I'm not speaking about Jameis Winston in particular, but repeatedly um, do things. And um, I, I think that it's such a privilege to come to a school like this or your school and uh, to be disrespectful in that way, to uh, get yourself in the paper, be charged with a crime, um, is, is, is just not tolerable. And I would, I would have them leave right away. And I think that if there were strict rules about, you know, DUI or possession of alcohol in a dorm by an athlete or, um, uh, well, I could go on and on. Uh, if there were strict rules and one infraction, boom, you're gone. I, I think that things would shape up a bit. Florida State during that era was winning big national title in thirteen. Uh, they, Huge. Winston was fabulous athlete. Yeah, they they uh, were undefeated until the playoff in in, in two thousand fourteen. Did the overall, I guess, populace at Florida State maybe were they like I guess intoxicated by that profile to the point where they sort of. I don't want to say look the other way, but maybe rationalized some of those transgressions by, by Jameis and then the, the, maybe the, the handling of it by Jimbo Fisher, in your opinion? Um, perhaps, but you also can't ignore the finances. The football team makes a lot of money for the university, and you've got a star athlete that's very largely driving the team's success. It'd be a very difficult decision to suspend or um, uh, expel that star athlete that is responsible for your team's success. So they might tend, because of financial reasons, to take a, a less stringent approach than I would recommend in a situation like that. But yeah, when your team is doing really, really well, you guys know that in Clemson, um, and intoxication is not necessarily too strong a word. It's fun. It's exciting. Um, lots of enthusiasm. Harder to be objective as you're looking at your own flaws, I guess, or potential flaws. Yeah. And you, it's easy to be more forgiving. Like, yeah. like you know, supporters of President Trump are, are forgiving for some of the things that he says and does that uh, that uh, people that are, well, let's say, Democrat would be would be less willing to forgive. What uh, how many games do you go home home games? Did you go to last year other than the Clemson game? Oh, maybe four. 
Any any uh, after the Clemson game? Um, don't think so. Don't think so. I, I don't. I don't go to every game. I don't have season tickets. I wish they gave them to the faculty as a fringe benefit, but they don't. Was just curious uh, how how often you're you were recognized as you're just going about your business in Tallahassee after that. No, almost never. I think I'd have to take my shirt off and sit in a chair <laughs> reading Jillian Flynn. <laughs> what? Is, what is? Go ahead. I, I sort of a bland appearance. Nothing. Nothing spectacular. What is the? What is that book about? I actually bought the book for the the Halloween costume, but ended up giving it away. What is? What's the? I never read it. What's it about? Oh, it's a it's a murder mystery. It's really well done, nice and intricate. She's a great writer, and she's written a couple of other things too that I've read and, and got. Did I read that? Or he? I think I listened to that podcast you were on last fall. Um, you said that you did a book signing before the Boston College game. Yeah, yeah. One of the restaurants asked me to come and and uh, and stand around and and sign a few books, which I did. Just any book. No, it was a Jillian Flynn type thing. The idea was come and bring your Jillian Flynn and book man would sign it. <laughs> and so the 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 people, the random people who were coming up to you during the game, was it? Yeah, there were several Clemson fans, right? Yeah, sure. Oh, they loved that. They were very happy in that game. They made all this long trip down to Tallahassee, and they got to see a big blowout in favor favor of Clemson. And so here's this bored looking Florida State fan. They were very happy with me. Have you ever – can you remember a, a game at Florida State when there were that many empty seats, that much aluminum exposed? <laughs> no, no, it's pretty pathetic. That was that was about the worst. Are – how turned off are Florida State fans right now? I mean, there was, I saw a recent article, I guess about a month ago, where they've sold only about 25,000 season tickets. Is this a big – I mean, I know you don't follow it that closely, but do you view it as as a something that's really concerning as far as people just stop stopping going to games? Yeah, it's very concerning. We have a bad season; ticket sales fall off, and um, you know the season tickets are really money drivers for the university. And um, I don't know the numbers. I'll, I'll take what you say. I wouldn't be surprised if season tickets were off. Um, but boy, if we can pick off a couple of wins early on in the season, I think people start start coming back. Particularly if we break into the top twenty-five, then maybe the top ten. Do you have any pointers for my uh, costume? Assuming that I, I choose to 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 use it again this coming year, did, did I get it? What did I get wrong? Did I I had, I had the spray tan? You need to gain about thirty pounds. <laughs> Did the camera add any any pounds? Uh, yeah, they were using the wide angle lens, I think. <laughs> Did you get any grief for the uh, for the length of your jeans? Oh yeah, a couple of people made comments on on blogs about that. Um, apparently, they were shorter than they thought was stylish. And and your response to that? <laughs> Not answerable to anybody else about the way I dress. <laughs> Have you been on... Next time I'll wear a thong. <laughs> I don't... That might, not be a, that might not be a good sequel. No, you're probably right. Um, what are you planning on wearing to games now, uh, moving forward? Um, I'll just be wearing my FSU shirt, golf shirt or long sleeve shirt, penning, sweatshirt, depending on the weather. Um but I have no plans now to reprise the uh, the bookman because, like I say, the first time was spontaneous and that was its charm. But if I do it again, it'll just look like attention seeking, and I don't want that. So, had your daughter and her friends stayed for the second half, would this have happened? Very unlikely. No, I would have sat with them. You know, every 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 twenty minutes, can we go get some candy? Can we get some drinks? Can we get popcorn? So I'm sort of like the ATM for this crowd of uh, young ladies while I'm at the game with them. And you stayed to the very end, right? The very end, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it was sunny. And so, as you're sitting there, and you know that this has become a story that people are talking about, what's going on? 
I had no idea how big it was going to be. Yeah. But you still, but you did know you were on TV. Right. But you didn't know right. they kept coming back to you, I guess. No, I didn't know that. But, you know, I, I tried to, not to do anything, you know, embarrassing, you know, scratch myself at an inappropriate <laughs> place or anything like that. <laughs> and uh, when did you finish the book? <laughs> Probably that night. <laughs> Uh, how I'm many, a fast reader. I'm a fast reader. Any idea how many pages you knocked out during the game? Yeah, quite a few, I'm afraid, particularly during that second half. All right. Anything else? Any? Uh, any? Hey, you, I hope that Clemson does really well this year. So are you? And I hope that Florida State and Georgia and Michigan do really well this year. They will see each other in the playoffs. Why do you hope Clemson does well? Well, you're a good team. You guys work really hard. You got a great coach, even though I didn't know his name. And, uh, <laughs> uh, I've had a couple of, I had a niece go to the Clemson. I have actually a couple of nieces go to Clemson. They had a really good undergraduate education there. And um, uh, you're good people. Plus, you're the South. And I think we Southerners need to stick together. Is Florida really the South, though? Absolutely. We're the only capital of the Confederate, one of the state capital of the Confederacy was never captured during the war between the states, except for us, uh, except for maybe Texas. Well, this is before the entire Northeast uh, moved down there. Yeah. Awkward, yeah, we awkward repulsed, silence. We, re, we, repl- we repulsed the Union invaders at the, in the Battle of Natural Bridge, where a bunch of teenage boys and old men went down about 10 miles south on one side of the river, and we prevented the Union from crossing and getting into Tallahassee. Very proud of that. <laughs> Are you really going to come to Clemson? Are you seriously entertaining that? Well, if, I that... Get an, if I get an invite, I might. Well, you already... Nothing. It was so. It was sort of vague. They said, okay. oh, "Come on down," and I said, "Sure, give me some specifics." But nothing happened. And oh, by the way, by the way, I am not a supporter of the Confederacy. I was making a joke there. I think the war between the states was a wonderful opportunity to help get rid of slavery in America. Duly noted. I'm guessing now that uh, a lot of listeners to this podcast hear that that you're serious about entertaining offers to come to Clemson and tailgate you're gonna you might uh you might get a few more uh you might get a few few more people reaching out that would be great a ticket would be good a box office box seat would be even better all right well we'll uh we'll, we'll put that out there and uh if, if you do come up we're gonna have to visit and and, and meet in person <laughs> that would be great love to do it Bruce Steyer FSU book guy not necessarily in that order thank you so much for joining us sir Oh, sure. Thanks for talking with me. All right. Thanks so much to Bruce for joining us and uh, sharing his story. Also, Chris Lowe for sharing a different kind of story, his story on uh, Dabo Sweeney's response to the uh, dumbest narrative of the (laughs) offseason. Sorry. Just calling it like I see it. Uh, Thanks to our six very loyal and generous sponsors for being a part of the program. Most of all, thanks all of you for making this a part of your routine. We will be back next week. Enjoy the rest of y'all's week, and be safe, everybody. Take care.